To create the Goetheanum, Rudolf Steiner invented another new art. In a thick pane of intensely colored glass, images appear, made of light, where matter is removed. He built another building, itself a work of art, just to make the windows, with windows matching the Goetheanum windows, so you could engrave them in the sunlight. Obviously, the intermediate floors are a later mutilation. Here is your equipment. A graver with a flexible axle, just invented, and bits made of carborundum from America, artificial silicon carbide, scarcely known in Europe at the time. A lift with an electric motor, and don't forget to keep water flowing over the pane while you work. Rudolf Steiner gave the recipes for the glass. Diagonal hatching brings the openness of the motifs in the monochrome depth. The result makes the masterworks of Chartres look lumpish in comparison. The whole building takes on a jewel-like quality, glowing at night from within. Shadows play in complementary colors, similar to those seen here in the second Goetheanum, floating freely, released from the forms in space. Farther in, objects appear in their true colors, but enlivened in an imaginative space. Once you enter and move amid the whole organism of windows, with its symmetry of colors, the building itself gives the sequence. In every triptych, there is a progression from left to right, and so also in the whole series, which resonates with ninefold man. The bodily members are gifts of the outer world, of the physical outer world with its mineral substances, of the etheric world of life, and of the world of the stars. The sentient soul delights in all that is warm and beautiful. The mind or gemute soul is the central member. The consciousness soul is objective, impersonal making possible the spectator attitude of modern natural science. When the bodily members are ennobled and spiritualized, they become the three highest members, spirit self, life spirit, and spirit man. Spirit man, the transformed physical body, has only once been fully realized so far as the resurrection body. In 1913, Rudolf Steiner assigned Asya Turgenev to the windows, but she soon quit and helped carve the wood instead because she could not bear the way the other artists warped the images into their favored styles or even treated his indications as raw material for their own creative effusions. In the 1940s, she made the windows for the second Goetheanum. We'll use mostly her etchings, because they realized the sketches faithfully in the original triptych format, even though the colors are not quite right. And indeed, the leftmost window shows the entrance, including the red central windows. In every window, the seeker of spirit appears. 
Each triptych shows polar composition. Here, the sky is bright on the left, dark on the right. The two-peaked mountain is dark on the left, bright on the right. In it, skulls appear on the left, plummeting. And on the right, living youthful faces rising. The spirit seeker is lying on the left, standing on the right. In the middle, he is in an intermediate position, more or less sitting. Under his seat is not a skull, but a decaying head. The sitting figure is often said to be meditating, but his unfocused posture does not support this interpretation. Also, Rudolf Steiner mentioned in passing that in one of the windows, dreaming man is shown. If you look closely at the original sketch, you see the word Schlafender on the left, which means one who is sleeping. On the right, he is evidently waking. In the left window, the portal is closed. Rudolf Steiner wrote on the sketch, Die Schwelle verhüllt sich, the threshold veils itself. The spirit seeker lies before the portal of a sanctuary, which, however, is closed to him. Its threefold composition, the dome above, the supports below, the emblem of balance in the middle, shows that its secret is the being of man. On the right, the spirit seeker plays the lyre. In the Chartres Cathedral, there is a standing donkey playing the lyre. In fairy tales, the donkey sometimes plays the lute. When man stands up, his physical body is ennobled, and he can bring it into harmony with the world all. The material world of the rock cliff is then imbued with light. Here the threshold reveals its human secret. Die Schwelle offenbart sich, the threshold reveals itself, Rudolf Steiner wrote on the sketch. In the first realm we enter after death, the ether atmosphere makes the same moral impression as violet blue, and that is also the realm from which we enter earthly life before birth. The manganese makes it less brilliant than the other colors. Deep calm gently lifts us beyond the limits of space and time. Bodily nature arises out of earthly substance. Before birth, in the sphere of the sun, we find our goals for transforming the earth. Its hardness provides resistance. We look back to our companions and forward to our future parents and join the necessities of the karmic relations with the possibilities in the stream of heredity. Only the face is complete, the head is still joined with higher streams the chest merges into the world of life forces. The hand, as organ of will, sends a dynamic central force to the father. Sheath-building forces gather around the mother. On the left, the body is lighter than its material surroundings, more awake. On the right, the soul on its way to incarnation 
is darker than the rest of the etheric world, hovering in the gentle downward influence of the moon. On the left, the earth is convex, covering the child. On the right, the earth is concave, receiving the child. The blue windows are the last to lose their color in the evening and the first to show it in the morning. Blue deepens soulful inwardness, longing for purity, says Kandinsky. Yet here we see desire. The diagonals are repeated, not mirrored, bringing imbalance. In older cultures, hunters used to pray to the group souls of the animals in request. Whenever we act, we intervene in a spiritual connectedness. We are usually unaware of this spiritual dimension, but it is real nevertheless. Man wants what lives in the heights for himself. The blue opens the depths of the great world, which then appear as the depths of the soul. From Pisces, the stars work down to the feet, which work earthward in the imagination of fishes carried in the grail moon. The star forces of Aries sparkle in concentrated clarity of thinking with the energy of the leaping ram. Taurus lifts the arms in speech, and so on. After the balance of Libra, the stars enter the lower more and more. All twelve together are one cosmic human body. Now man the hunter concentrates his will on this point. To allow him to act, a space opens up in the spiritual world. The spiritual beings withdraw, but accompany what happens with their consciousness. The middle three groups are all above doorways. They show threshold stages. In green, the soul remains at an elemental level of experience, seeking the balance of yellow and blue, light and dark. The spirit seeker feels a kinship with something mysterious above him. The kefir protects the head from heat and emphasizes consciousness. Lucifer sports an exaggerated version of this headgear. Ancient initiates used the astral effects of the hair, hence they were bearded. In the mystery dramas, Benedictus, as a modern initiate, is beardless. Here the spirit seeker has only an upper body and a head, with no ground under him. He gazes upward with a gesture of longing, consumed in desire, lifted from the earth. Higher beings appear, warding off his passion, then as they ascend, gesturing more and more toward a purer light and fire. The light comes from above, in both the left and the right windows. On the right it has descended farther, and turned inside out. Usually, our central consciousness is asleep to our peripheral self. On the right, after withstanding the Luciferic trial, 
the seeker of spirit has assumed responsibility for his own higher consciousness. He consecrates his body as a column in the temple of humanity. The headdress and beard are antique. The fifth column is of our present age. Red presses forward, demanding that you ennoble yourself to meet it. The antechamber with the red windows is even carved of reddish beech. At sunset, when the gaze seeks the transition to inward gazing, the glow intensifies. The small windows at the terrace doorways have double panes with clear glass outside and yellow inside. On the mountain shown at the beginning, the seeker is now near the top, but must still pass through a dip. From the abyss emerge those forces in the human soul that prevent essential being, a thinking that flaps its wings but goes nowhere, a sneering, bloating life of feeling, a will wide awake and at the same time brutal, with long pointy ears and bristles on its bald skull. Doubt, hatred, and fear threaten his balance. They are the lesser guardian of the threshold. Deal with these and transform them, and only then do you encounter the greater guardian. The countenance is open to the surroundings. Eons of cosmic evolution form the image of future humanity. On the sun side, by the raying, the lion unfolds its powerful force. He stands in the zodiac where the sun is at its most fiery. On the moon side, where waves surround a center, the bull or cow as metabolic animal receives the tone he stands in the zodiac where the spring sun condenses matter. The gaze asks, Know thyself. On his brow, giving and receiving form an organ of cognition. In the area of the larynx, the sixteen-petaled chakra turns, and the twelve-petaled heart chakra appears as a picture within the picture, a healing battle with the dragon, an etheric image of the archangel Michael joins battle in the human heart. Beyond the abyss, the spiritual world as source of essential being is here shown as the sun. The longing gesture toward the sun in the previous triptych now finds its rightful fulfillment. Angels work even in the depths. The three beasts are not gone but in check. You can still see the hairdo of the one. Facing this triptych is the entrance to the inner space of the Goetheanum. Subnatural beings bind man to the earth, exaggerating his legs 
The seven planets regulate him. The pinnacle experience of the previous triptych now reverts to the outer world of the senses, but in its spiritual dimension. Here he manages to face the power that would make him unfree, the granddaddy of all corkscrew demons. Its body is a zigzag crank, its wings bear downward. Gravity shows the solar system as machine. The planet screw narrows in its downward windings to a point. With a tall pointy head, giant ears that suck in all information, antenna-like horns, and an hypnotic stare, it manifests a robotically compelling intelligence. Electricity flashes about the seeker. At the dawn of the modern age, the first hierarchy consigned the cosmic intelligence to man's head amid supersensory electrical storms. In the corresponding window in the south, he was drawn upward and to our left by beauty. Here in the north, he is confronted by a repellent being pulling downward and to the right. Walking brings freedom in our relation to gravity. Now the subterraneans drop their arms. The planets accompany his journey. His own will is born. He touches his head and turns his gaze inward for reflective thinking near the waxing moon forces. A moon eye left and a sun eye right are lovingly bestowed upon the spirit seeker by beings of the higher hierarchies so that in his gaze a receiving and a giving join to the higher cognitive faculty of imagination. The crystalline forms show that the outer predominates. The deeper faculty of inspiration perceives the streaming harmonies of the spheres. These tend more toward images in the lowest third of the window and more toward pure forces in the highest. In each third, there is again a threefold hierarchy. Number ether lives in his thinking. Free of the body, the image of threefold man separates into eagle, lion, and bull. The will forces of the bull here energize thinking. The upper stream of light flows freely. The middle is articulated. The lower darkened in places with an inner life of its own. The sequence of living beings appears more earthly as it descends and increasingly distinct from the surroundings. The south window shows the cosmos in man. The north, man in the cosmos. In the right window, his gesture has changed. With formative thinking, you not only see but also grasp what you see with spirit hands by the deepest cognitive faculty, intuition. The sun is now rising before him. The moon is waning. The interior of the earth is changed too. The crystalline forms 
have been replaced by organic forms. The inner predominates. In the left window he stands on the earth. In the right he enters it. In violet, the depth of blue is enhanced to inwardness and meditative concentration. Death is the great analyst. The angel separates the condensed physical body, the life archetype, the threefold soul nature, and the eternal eye, shown here as a star illumining the whole upper part of the window. He now looks back on his life and sees that that light surrounded him faithfully throughout. The light has the same shape as the stark tablets of the law, showing that it is karmic justice, but it is also the gentler light of grace surrounding the event of Golgotha. The mourners correspond to the spirit companions bidding the unborn farewell. There is a sleep deeper still than dreamless sleep in which we experience crystals from within them. We would die there if not for the power of Christ. Hence the legends of a hero such as King Arthur, Charlemagne, Wenceslas, or Barbarossa waiting after death within a crystal mountain until the ravens, as messengers of the spiritual world, bring tidings of the second coming. In the left window, the bull or cow lives in the mystery of matter. In the right, the lion shows the breakthrough to the spirit. In pink, which is hard to reproduce, the inwardness of violet deepens yet again. You can feel at home in the color where the self and the world are one. The spirit seeker has become Christ-like and turns with a blessing, helping gesture to Lucifer, healing the imbalanced upward orientation by creating a connection to the three crosses on Golgotha. Only in the last two triptychs do these three crosses appear. Here they bring light to transform the earth, which otherwise would be cut off from the cosmos. Man stands awake before the living, breathing world in which he senses the presence of a mild countenance. Invisible behind him, accompanying him, yet leaving him free, stands the angel. The purely selfless eye has the world as its content and lives entirely in loving and giving. It meets the eye of the world. The countenance in the first triptych gazes. This one listens. In the last window, the center of events lies in the lower part. The redemption of Ahriman begins. Again, in relation to the event of Golgotha.